posting these across most of the wacky forums. We did one in uh, the API recently in Johannesburg. Um, and we've seen the need for a structured hospitality forum specifically focused on this asset class. Um, it hasn't gotten maybe the limelight it should have. So we're trying to just bring it to the fore forefront. Um, again, this is the inaugural one. Um, if uh, anybody has any uh, comments or you know, uh, ways for us to improve it in the future, we're more than happy to get your feedback afterwards. My name is Alan. Um, I work for HR Consulting. Um, we're a hospitality consulting firm uh, based in Cape Town, Mauritius. We've been in existence for about 20 years now, um, and we've worked in about 49 countries across Africa. So we've been pretty much everywhere. Um, we've done quite a lot of work in, in, in West Africa and in Nigeria specifically. Um, I'm going to just give a brief presentation on the hospitality market, just reflecting where, how far we've come, uh, where we are sort of here today to, to the uh, sort of top one performance standards. Or if you just can quickly uh, go to the next, there we go. Okay, I don't want to bore you too much with statistics, but I think it's just important again to reflect on how far we've come. I've just focused on three of sort of one of the core markets in, across West Africa. Um, in terms of occupancy, obviously telling us how quickly demand is coming back. Nigeria is one of the leaders across the continent in terms of demand bouncing back. You can see year to date occupancy is sitting at 64%, which is phenomenal. It really is a, a very positive story to tell. Um, uh, Ivory Coast uh, is lagging behind still a little bit. They're about 84% recovery relative to the same period in, in 2019. Um, and then obviously Ghana, it had a very strong start to the year, but uh, it slowed down a little bit and they're sitting at about 56% occupancy yet today. It's about 90% recovery. So across the region, we see um, you know, demand recovery sitting at anywhere between 70 to 80% for, for, for some markets, whereas others have um, you know, obviously surged beyond that. 80, 90 percent recovery in the market is quite common. If you go to Indian Ocean Islands, you'll see um, again um, the market has recovered beyond 2019 levels. And obviously, like I said, Nigeria already exceeded that. I mean, we just go to the next one. So um, another important thing to consider is obviously rates. Um, when we're in a low demand cycle period, rates uh, tends to be impacted. Um, Obviously, during this period, we actually, it was actually quite interesting to see how Italia has managed uh, discounting years during this period. Rates have obviously uh, dropped quite a bit in 2020, but they bounced back pretty quickly in 2021. And if you look at ADRs in terms of recovery for year to date, you'll see Nigeria already seeing a little bit of growth in that. Ghana pretty much flat and par uh, in 2019 and I request almost there. So this is really encouraging. Um, next one. So red bar is really the important thing we're looking at. So that's the combination of the demand and rates. And here again, you can see Nigeria doing exceptionally well. We have 22% growth on top of uh, 2019 levels. That's phenomenal. Um, obviously, I request lagging behind uh, because of demand. And then Ghana also at about 90%. Um, so I think in general, this is a pretty good picture. It's quite optimistic. Um, and uh, you know, going forward, we expect obviously a lot of these markets to reach full recovery by probably about 2023. Some may take a bit longer into 2024. But certainly for Nigeria, we've seen um, a recover already by 2022. I think exceeded a lot of our expectations. I think there's the next one. Yeah. So you, one must always consider you know um, performance which is always backwards looking um, relative to future supply. So um, Trevor also does quite a lot of work in this space with his hotel uh, pipeline report. But Nigeria in general um, is about five thousand rooms in the pipeline. 
Uh, only about 2,000 of that is currently active. Um, so I see there's a there's a typo there. But in terms of Lagos um, specifically, I think we're looking at somewhere in the region of about five to six hundred rooms, which are sort of active active. Um, Ghana again it's a lot smaller part, about two thousand seven hundred of these uh, expected to come to the market in about twenty twenty five. Um, but they have quite a big supply pipeline coming as well, about 1,200 potential rooms there. So again, it's likely to affect um, their recovery and, and afford uh, growth. Uh, I repeat the same thing, about 2,000 rooms, about four to 600 being active. Um, it's quite interesting, we've seen from the past, if you look at the pipeline, um, obviously not all of those hotels are going to materialize. We only see about a third of that usually come to market. Uh, a lot of them fall by the wayside as hotel cycles, as we go through cycles in the hospitality industry, like for example COVID, a lot of these projects um, uh, fall by the wayside. I mean post-COVID what we've seen realistically only about 15 to 20 percent of projects are actually really live. A lot of those have been affected by things like um, being able to actually get debt um, that is affordable. So a lot of those, a lot of greenfield projects we find are under a lot of pressure at the moment because of the capital market. Okay, the next one. Um, I think it's just interesting also to look at what some of the operators are doing in the region. So for example, Radisson, um, they've signed quite a few deals in West Africa recently, Earl Heights, Oxford Street, uh, Dupa, Sali, um, and Radisson service apartments in Yamundi, so that's quite a decent pipeline. Um, openings before the end of the year in Earl Heights and uh, a, a project in, in Zambia. Um, their pipeline is quite strong, so I'll just go back, Mary. Right? Um, they're, they're planning to open about 16 hotels and have signed about uh, 25 new hotels. There you go. So that's quite a strong, strong performance from their side. And uh, if you just want to go to the next one. Um, then IHG, I know um, it's not officially announced yet, but uh, they have said that we can mention it, but uh, a 250 key hotel in Cameroon. Um, and obviously, it's not West Africa, but one of the key landmark projects has uh, recently opened, which is the Intercontinental in Rwanda. Uh, Battle are also, have also signed an asset management agreement for, with, with the owners of K Hotels to manage one of the hotels in Douala. Uh, and Apple obviously have been quite busy, um, not only in terms of their own deals that they're signing, but also on their acquisition side. Um, some of their key deals is the uh, Novotel, Pamakri, um, two, um, the Servitel um, and in Benin and the Novitel in um, Mauritania, and also very recently announced the acquisition of uh, Lamington in, um, uh, in Senegal, which is great. Uh, thank you. Just in terms of transaction activity, um, again, we've seen a lot of activity out of the two main funds. Uh, um, on the continent, which is obviously the Actus Restaurant Partnership and Casada. Um, um, just some recent purchases, obviously the Actus Restaurant uh, purchasing of the, of the Sheraton, the City Lodge portfolio, uh, which is one of the projects that, that, that we helped on the due diligence. Um, and then obviously again recently the uh, acquisition of Sally. Um, so they've been pretty much the most active buyers on the continent at the moment. Uh, I think if you go to the next one. Um, I think when COVID started, especially from our side, we were anticipating a lot more stock to come into the market uh, from a transaction point of view. Um, but we found that not to be the case. Um, what we actually realized was well, when all of this went down, um, there was a complete disconnect between um, uh, you know, seller expectation in terms of price that they could get um, and the view, the view from a buyer's perspective in terms of buying um, you know, value, value assets at, at a discount. So there hasn't really been that much uh, transaction activity um, really, not as much as we expected. Um, 
So we've seen a little bit of movement start to pick up now in off-market transactions. Um, you know, discussions with banks in terms of amicable sales. Um, we've seen some interest to get out of, of, of certain of certain um, certain deals. So that's starting to move. Um, restructuring, that's been one of the main things that have hampered this uh, transaction environment from really kind of kicking into gear. The banks are really kind of trying to find ways of rescuing projects, kicking the can down the road. We'll see how long that will last. Um, but certainly when the banks have reached the end of their tether in terms of the structure, I think that's when we're going to really start seeing um, transaction activity increase. We haven't really seen any foreclosures so far. Um, and then from a lease point of view, we've actually seen some lease activity in some Africa country, which is also quite interesting. Um, owners are trying to do risk their projects while they sign a lease for 10 years. Um, while the market comes back, the value leaves up of it, and then we either exit or we flip back to a franchise or a management agreement. So that's essentially just a broad overview of, of, of how far we've come. I think this overall um, optimism uh, in the West African market, the coverage is looking good, the numbers are looking good. I think going forward, there might be a bit of headwinds that we're anticipating, and obviously um, uh, implications like increasing inflation, Currency volatility, all of these are quite a big concern. And specifically on greenfield projects, uh, development cost has become quite a big issue. Um, we've seen development cost inflation of anywhere between 20 to 30 percent um, uh, on, on greenfield projects. So those are making the numbers quite hard on, uh, on, on new uh, greenfield projects. Um, that's it for my presentation. I don't think I have any more slides. Yeah. So I think let's just kick off with the panels.